Good morning, everybody. I'm Charlotte Buchanan Yale, Director of the Museum of Native American History in the fabulous Bentonville, Arkansas. I'm Charlotte Buchanan Yale, Director of the Museum. It's always my honor to walk through those great doors every day. And today is our monthly program, Hear Our Voices, that's curated by the magical Cherokee storyteller, Ms. Gail Ross. Uh, before we get started, we always want to acknowledge that we are broadcasting live from the ancestral home of the Quapa, the Caddo, and the Osage nations. And, um, you know, what we do with our mission at the Museum of Native American History is we braid time. And it's our honor to connect the past with present day indigenous cultural leaders, trailblazing, making history today. And we forward this on to educate future generations. And we hope that you'll build on traditional knowledge and create whatever your talent and gift is, sustainable plans for the planet. And that will move us into next month, which would be our Earth Day presentation. But right now, this is our month. It is Women's History Month, and we are dedicated to women around the world. And we have the most perfect, perfect presenter for you today. Um, and I want to, oh, I'm gonna turn this over to Ms. Gale, but the title of this is Drawing Strength from the Past uh, for the Forward Journey. And, um, you know, the stories today always gonna to remind you that history starts at home. All of you boys and girls of all ages, start talking to your family. You know, it's so important that you know who you are and you put roots into this beautiful earth that we walk on. Um, Ms. Gail Ross, are you in the house? I am in the house. Well, Let's it is always you. my my pleasure to introduce the fabulous storyteller who curates our monthly program here, our voices, Ms. Gail Ross. Osio Binali, I'm so glad to be back with you, even though it's Zoom world and not yet meet space. Um, but I'm really happy to be back today to introduce a dear friend of mine and an incredibly talented woman. Eldrina Duma grew up in a world of stories, stories from her uh, Laguna, Tua and Hopi families. For many years, she was a teacher and those, those things about her are what add up to her becoming one of the most beloved native tellers in the country. I've been so blessed to work with her many times. And today she is going to be sharing some really important stories, both from her family and about other Native women who are keeping us on the road, headed in the right direction. <laughs> so I don't want to waste any more of her time. Um, please welcome my dear friend, Eldrina Duma. Oh, and there's a story about her name, too. She just might tell us. Thank you so much, Gail. I appreciate you more than you can imagine. And it's, um, it was a blessing to be able to uh, find out about the, uh, about the Museum of Native American History in Bentonville. Uh, I, I talk about you guys all the time because you're like a hidden jewel in beautiful mountain area uh, right there where you sit. And um, I know I visited your place just one time and I love the journey just, just coming to you. And so today, um, what I'm gonna be talking about mainly are the influencers of my life um, from the time I was a young girl. I did not realize that there were so many women that had um, accomplished great things in this world. When I was growing up, all I knew were about the women around me. And to me, they were great women. They were strong women. Some of them had to raise families on their own. Um, and many of them had many children, but they didn't seem to complain. It was just a way of life. You just, you just did it. Um, you figured out a way to do it. And because we lived in villages, Pueblo villages, when I was growing up, um, we had people all around us to step in and help us in whatever capacity that they could give, whether it was just an encouraging word, a, a laughter, a story, um, taking care of the children, bringing food over, inviting you to come eat. You know, there was always something that you could do as a community. And I think that's the thing I miss the most um, 
living away from the villages that I grew up with is that I, even though I live in a community here in Texas now, um, pretty much if I need to go amongst people, I have to make that effort, but it's worth it to me. And so first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my name. My maiden name is Duma in the English pronunciation. It came from my grandfather, but his name was Dalma, and it means singing as you go. When I was younger, I remember my Saya, her name was, English name was Nelly, and I knew her as Saya because in Tewa, that's what we call our grandmothers. And so I was living with my, my Saya and my dad in Arizona, um, right below First Mesa, Palaka Village. And she would constantly be telling me about life. Her Between her and my dad and all the relatives that would come and go through the house, the people next door to us, um, the ones down below from us, you know, there was constant story, like Gail said. It was like just breathing air. It was there. And so when I began my journey as a storyteller, um, I didn't even know that, that that was something that people did professionally until it was brought to my attention. And so my grandmother sat me down one time and she said, come here, I wanna tell you something. So I went and sat beside her and she says, now I know that you're a woman, you're a girl, you're gonna be a woman. But one day when you get married, um, you are going to be carrying on your husband's last name. But you have brothers, and I don't know if they will ever um, learn about their last name. It came from um, your, your grandfather, Douglas. His name used to be Thauma. And when he went to boarding school, they could not pronounce that or write it. So they gave him the name Duma. And they gave him the name Douglas. When your father was given that name Douglas, he said, what does that mean? And the people said, we don't know. It's just a name and we're giving it to you. And he thought that was strange that people would just hand out names for no reason at all and never have the meaning behind it. Because, you know, she said, we are all brought up with uh, names that have been giving us through clans or family. Um, and so that is the name of how your grandfather got the name Duma, but it's actually Dauma. His aunties gave him that name because every time they would see him coming down from the Mesa, going to his field, he would always be singing everywhere he went. You could hear his songs. And so that's why they called him that singing as you go. And so I remembered um, that and I said, Saya, I'll try to remember that and I'll tell my brothers one day. And that one day came and I was able to, to tell my, my brothers about that. Little did she know that she was creating in me a vessel that was going to be able to carry stories. And the stories that I love the most, I know a lot of people when... Um, when they bring me to their place, they want to hear about the animal stories, the folk tales, the legends, the myths. And I'm the stories that I love the most are the people stories. And so anytime I have an opportunity to come and sit with somebody, I want to know their story. And, and when they tell me their story, there's always a link to history. And so a lot of the women that I'm going to bring up to you today, um, they have they are a part of history, and some of them may not be in the books that I'm going to show you, but they have a story, and they have influenced me with their life story, and I might be able to mention them too if I don't forget. And so the first one that I'm going to talk about is the one that I grew up with, my great-grandmother, Nempeo. Now, she was just a story to me. Her name was all around because my grandmother, her daughter, continued to make pottery just like her mother did. And so as Saya would um, sit down and start working on her pottery, our day, our day actually began with us um, getting up early. My Saya and my dad would always get up early and they would start um, making their hot water for their postum. 
um, because they were Mormons and Mormons didn't drink caffeine. So they had this uh, dried little drink that came in a jar and and they would put a scoop of that in their hot water and and it tasted like coffee it smelled like coffee but it was called postum and i remembered that and i remember the day that i talked my dad into letting me drink some because um they sometimes would have the uh, pet milk in the can and they would have that um, metal opener and and pop those little holes in it and pour that milk out and it always looked so nice and creamy in that drink. And so one day my dad let me have some. And of course, it didn't have caffeine. And so I didn't grow any uh, hair on my chest because they used to say, don't be drinking coffee when you're, you're going to grow hair on your chest. Well, I'm glad they gave me postum because I didn't have any hair on my chest. Well, Saya would always prepare a few things. Uh, she was not a wealthy woman, uh, very simple. You know, a lot of people talk about um, uh, becoming min uh, minimalist and stuff like this. Well, I grew up in that world. Um, we lived in a tiny house. <laughs> we had uh, compost or uh, outside bathrooms, um, no running water. So we had to go down to the well and get it in buckets. Eventually, the water came into her house and, um, and then electricity, too. I remember uh, just growing up with Coleman lanterns um, hung throughout the house. And I remember when my dad would say, okay, you better get to bed. I'm getting ready to turn it off. And I would run to the floor because my Saya and I would um, pile up blankets on the floor to sleep on. And my dad would sometimes take the, the twin bed that was there. Every now and then they would switch, but more, most of the time Saya slept on the floor with me. And my dad would say, I'm going to turn off the, the lantern now. So he turned it off. And I just remember wherever I was, I was going to make it under the covers before it went off. And you could hear that sound. And as soon as that sound was over, I made sure I was under the covers. Now, stories didn't stop just because the lights were off, because that was when we would have our nighttime stories. And I would, I became a question bug and I'd start asking them all kinds of questions. And I'd tell my dad, dad, sing me a song so I can go to sleep. And he'd ask, well, what kind of song would you like to, me to sing? And I would give him my list, corn boy song, morning kachina song, the uh, red, the velvet shirt dance songs. I used to love hearing those. And one time when we were up on top on the mesa, we would go to the plaza and the houses would be all around the plaza like a square. And the people could go up on top of the people's houses and sit on the edge and look down. Of course, people down below had their chairs all around so that when the dancers came in, they would greet them. But I liked sitting on top of the houses looking down because you could see everything. You could see the kachinas coming and the dancers and the singers right there along with them. My favorite of that group was the one that usually was an older man and he would come in and boy, he would be telling the story of the song with his hands and moving his hands all around while he was dancing too. And I would sit there and say, dad, what is that man doing? What is he doing? And he said, he's telling the story. He's telling the story to the people of the songs that they're singing. And so you watch his hands when he lifts them up. He's talking about the clouds and the rains that are coming and what direction these songs are coming from and all of this. And that was my favorite thing. Maybe that's because I realized as I grew up that when I told stories, I couldn't tell them without using my hands. And so Zoom has helped out with that. I can't flay, flay them all over the place. Um, one of my uh, friends that lived here in in Amarillo, she was from the Oto, Pawnee, and Potawatomi tribe. She used to laugh at me and she'd say, oh, sister, I don't know what would happen if we tied your hands down and asked you to tell a story. I don't think you could do it. I said, well, I'd probably move my whole body instead. And so she would just laugh at me. But getting back to me growing up with my great-grandmother, Stories Nempeu, my grandmother, Saya. Um, she and my dad, they worked together. They were kind of um, partners. She would get her pottery work out of her little desk that she had 
inside that desk, she had her paint rock. She had her little glasses um, and her stones. She would even have uh, designs that she had on paper so she wouldn't forget the designs that, that were coming to her mind and maybe some of her mother's designs. And then um, she would put the lid down after she'd open it up, put everything on there and get her little glasses, put them on. And then she would begin working her clay or painting her pottery, sanding, polishing. And as she would do that, she would either sing some songs, hum it, or um, just tell stories. And my father, he would pick up his cotton wood and he would get his kachina, um, everything he needed for his kachinas to make. He would be outside either carving. And if he was painting, he would be inside too with my saya. And so my world was filled with artists. And in all of that, stories were told. My saya and my dad would tell me stories about maybe the kachina he was making, where it came from, what it did, um, the type of songs that would be sung. My saya would tell about the times that she was growing up with her mother and the journeys they took. And so I would sit there and listen to all these stories about the Grand Canyon. Um, and then one of my favorite stories was when she said that one day some people from the north came to get her and her mother and dad and several other um, Hopi people. And they were going to take them on in, in a wagon to the train station. Now, she never told me what train station it was. It could have been Winslow. It could have been Holbrook. But they were taking them there because they were going to take this train to a far off place. And so she said the journey to the town was long. And when they got there, they had to wait because the train was not there yet. And so they were sitting around talking to themselves. And um, now I did not know this at the time, but in one of the books that I had read about my grandmother, um, there were several books that, that are written about her. And so um, when I was looking through it, in one of the books, it said that Nellie Duma was allowed to go with her mother and her father to uh, Chicago as an interpreter. And she was just a young child. I did not know that part of her story. And so this story that she was telling me, that was that story in the book that I was reading. And after I finished, I just kind of laughed and I said, Saya, if I would have known that somebody was writing all about this, I would have asked you, you know, your side of the story. What did you think about traveling? And, and then they said that she was allowed to take another friend with her. And that piqued my curiosity when I read that. I said, well, what friend did she choose to take? Of course, it was probably just to keep her, uh, give her a companion along the way. But she said when they got to the uh, station there, they waited for the train. And as soon as the train, they could hear it coming, all of the people were getting together, gathering up, and um, then they heard the conductor say, all aboard. And so they all began to get up and she would interpret for the people because she could speak Tewa and Hopi and English. And so she would tell everybody what was going on, what they needed to do next. And as they came out onto the landing part of it, where the train was pulling up, they, that's when her father saw what was before his eyes. Have you ever thought about what people thought when they saw something for the very first time? Well, when my grandfather had, a uh, great grandfather had seen this, he stopped in his tracks. And he told his family that he was going to turn around and go home. Well, that shocked them. And they said, what are you talking about going home? You can't go home. We're here. The, uh, we're getting ready to leave to the place that they're taking us. And he said, I don't care. I'm, I'm going to go home. And they said, you can't go home. Look, it's already late. 
by the time you go, it's going to be dark and we don't have a wagon for you to go back. And he goes, that's okay. When I was a young boy, I used to run these desert lands to bring mail to these places. I know my way. And they said, yes, but you're not a young man anymore. You're an older, uh, older man. What happened? Why are you changing your mind? And then he looked out and he pointed and he said, I'm not going to get on that black snake. And they said, what? I'm not going to get on that snake. It's look, it's eating up the people. Why would we get go over there and feed ourselves to the snake? And they said, no, 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 that's not a snake. That's called a train. It's putting people on it so that it takes them where they want to go. I don't care what they say. That's a snake and it's eating people. Well, they had to spend time to convince him to get on that train. So they got on, got off, got on, got off to show him that they were not getting eaten up. They finally convinced him to get on and on the way they went. Now, Saya said when they got to this place, it was a long ways away. And when they got there and they got rested, the people that brought them took them to the place where they were going to be displaying all of the artwork. And they said people from all over the world were going to come and see the work of the native artist there. And so they had potters, kachina doll makers, moccasin uh, makers, weavers. They had uh, people from other tribes there too. And so Saya said that when they got there, they said, Nembeo, we want to take you to the place where you are going to be um, for the people to come and see you and your work. And they walked them to this place and they opened the door. They took them in and she said, my, this was a, a big place. And they said, what do you think, Nempeo? What do you think about all of this? And she looked around and in particular, they wanted to know about the pottery, what she thought about the pottery. And my Saya said that she walked over because her eyesight was kind of um, not so good at that time. So she had to get a closer look and she inspected all of the different pots that were there. And finally she stood up and said, my, whoever was the potter sure knew how to do this work. They're good potters. And they all looked at her surprised and they said, Nempeo. Do you not know who did all this work? No, but whoever they did, they're good potters and somebody taught them well. And they kind of looked and they said, Nempeo, all of these are your pots. We have brought them in from collectors throughout the world so that the rest of the people could see everything that you have done since the time you were young. My Saya said she just stood there in silence for a little bit with her head down, her eyes closed, shaking her head. And then she looked up and said, my, I guess I am a good potter, huh? And they said, yes, you are one of the best in all the world. And that is why we have this on display for them to come and see. When my Saya said that to me, it, it stirred in me a sense of pride. And I didn't understand that pride. I didn't know what it meant. Um, I didn't know much about her beyond the walls of my Saya. And of course, I would see her descendants that were potters, and they were great potters. Um, Dextra Kotskova, I have, um, she was an aunt of mine. Um, I have a cousin that uh, makes wonderful figurines and tiles and pots. And her, her work is beautiful. And her name is Darlene James. You can find her on Facebook. She's there too. Well, but one of the things that I kind of forgot that I did, but I had gifted a pot that I worked on as a class project when I went to high school at Laguna Acoma High School in New Mexico. I had a wonderful art teacher by the name of James Dudding. And he always used to let me come in and work on things whenever I got things done in my classes. 
Now, that was a good way to inspire me to get work done because he said, if you get your work done in your classes and your teacher gives you a note, you can come here and work on some things. And I loved art. And so I saw a pot that was in his uh, kind of his storage area. And I said, whose pot does that belong to? And he says, I don't know. Somebody made it and they never came back and worked, finished it. And I said, can I go ahead and take that pot and maybe put a design on it? He said, sure. I said, will it count as one of my grades? And he said, yes. And so I took it. And I made this in high school. I painted on it when I was in high school and got a grade. And I didn't even realize this, but I, I had put my picture at the bottom of it for my friend. And so when my friend was leaving their office and um, retiring, I was contacted. And the person told me, now, Drina, I know you gave this to me as a gift, but I don't think my family would appreciate it once I'm gone, like your family would. And I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not doing this um, because I don't want it. I do, but I'm afraid that if a time comes when I'm gone, what will happen to it? I'd much rather it be in your family. And so I had forgotten all about it. And when I received this gift back, oh my goodness, I thought, oh, I remember I have a picture of it, but now I have it in real, real life. And it can be something that I give to my children, if not for nothing else, just the fact that I say to myself, you know, um, if I had chose to become a potter, that right there gave me an example that I could do it. And so with that being said, this one looks very much like it. This is um, the work of my Saya. And I kept this because there's a story behind it. One day when my dad and I, we were cleaning up around the house and Saya had gone outside because she had, um, was baking her pottery and she was going to go out there to go check it and see how things came um, with the pots. Now, if any of the potters are out there, uh, you know, you know that your heart kind of um, skips a beat when you're going to uncover what the fire has baked, because you never know if you're gonna get back what you put in there. And so all of a sudden, my father and I, we heard her screaming outside, oh my, my, my goodness, oh no. And so we ran outside to try to find out what was going on. And we said, Saya, what happened? And she said, oh, a second, she said, my, my pot, she said, I guess the, when the wind was starting to blow, it didn't let the fire get hot enough. And some of the, some of the wind kind of cooled it down probably too fast. And so it broke several of my pots and some of them didn't completely turn brown. They still have a little bit of gray on it. So they're not completely baked. And so she had grabbed this one. And I said, Saya, I said, I said, don't, what are you going to do with that? She goes, oh, I'll just break it. I said, why? She says, because it's no good. She says, it's broken. And I said, and she says, I'll just break it and use it for my other pots to come to protect them. And that's what they usually do. They go ahead and reuse the pots to protect the pots they're going to bake the next time. And I said, Saya, no, 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 don't break that. I will take it, let me have it. And she says, no, this is broken. She said, I'll make you another one. I said, Saya, you say that, but whenever the tourists come, the pots you're working on or you're baking for me, you end up selling it to them. This might be the only one I have. And so she said, okay, well, the back part of it came off. And the part that was back here just kind of fell and I grabbed it 
thinking that one day I would be able to put it back on. But through all my moves, I think I lost it somewhere. But I still have her pot. And I'm glad I kept it because I never got a pot from her. And so even though this might be something that would have been broken or thrown away, isn't that kind of like life? Sometimes when things are broken, we think that they're no good, but others will see the value in it. And so at a young age, I saw the value of this broken pot. And I'm glad I kept it. Makes a great story, <laughs> but it's a great memory of the, the things that I was surrounded by when I was a, a young girl. And so my Saya, um, sh she continued to tell stories. And I remembered when I went to college, I didn't think I was going to be able to go to college because I thought, you know, I don't really. I'm just having a hard time with English and math and the sciences. Now I like art and social studies and all that kind of things, but that other stuff is too hard. I don't, you have to know all that to go to college, but I had a wonderful advisor by the name of Brad Ferris and he continued to encourage me. I had an older brother by the name of Clifford Duma and my nephew is named after him and he's no longer with us because a drunk driver um, hit the car that he was in head on and it killed him right uh, the year before he was going to graduate from high school. But before he left, he gave me so many words, wise words for a young man. And um, he encouraged me to look beyond my world. I couldn't do it at the time. I said, brother, I can't, I'm, I just want to graduate. I can't see myself outside beyond Laguna or any place else. Um, I feel like my my destiny is is just to, you know, get married, find a job here, and and I think that's pretty much what I'm going to do. And and that would be good if that happened. And he said, "But Drina, I want you to think beyond. You can always come back here. You can always come back here. But think beyond here. What do you want to do? Where do you want to go?" I couldn't imagine. I just couldn't imagine. And so, but he continued to feed me. He continued to feed me and give me his experiences with people. Um, and so after he passed away, it's almost like all of those stories that he had filled me up with were starting to bubble up and starting to come up and make its place in my head. And I would remember, oh yes, my brother said this, or my brother encouraged me to do this. My brother, I can. I can graduate. I can do this and I will do this. He wanted to go to college. I can't even imagine going to college, but he wanted to go to college. So I'm going to do my best to go to college on his behalf because that was what he wanted. And so I know looking back, he probably would have said, Drina, don't do it for me, do it for yourself. And so I was honored to be blessed by a wonderful, loving brother. And so when I did go to college and I was accepted, um, one day when I was uh, in class, our, our children's literature teacher said, I want you to go to the library and look up these books and um, um, you know, talk a little bit about them. And in our next class, she gave us a list. So I never really went to the library. When I was growing up, the library back at our high school was dreary and um, hardly any color, no life, you know, it's like, ooh, I didn't even want to be there. The books had no pictures, you know, anything like this. And so they, it was not my joy to be there. But during the time that I was going to college, the authors that were coming out and the children's books that were being made were just vibrant and, and full of life. And so I happened to be going in that direction. I, I stopped where it said uh, the, the books on history. And then at the bottom, it had Native American books. And while I was walking by, I was seeing books that had the name of my grandmother, Nimpeo, my great grandmother. And I said, what? There's books written about her? And so I started to pull them out one by one. And I opened the pages and I thought, oh, as I read them and I saw pictures 
I thought, oh, these are the things that my Saya was talking about. Who are these people that would be interested to write a book about my great grandmother? And then I heard from one of my relatives that there was going to be a pottery exhibit in Albuquerque on the campus of UNM. And so um, it was called Seven Families in Pueblo Pottery. And I knew that my grandmother was going to be there. And so I asked, I got a, a ride from somebody because I did not have a car. And I asked somebody to take me with them and drop me off at this place. And so they did. And I went to the museum and I knew my Saya was going to be there. And so I walked in very quietly and they had these humongous pictures of the people hanging from the ceiling and all my relatives were there. And I was just so excited to see these huge pictures of my relatives hanging down. And, you know, my, my grandmother and her daughter, Marie, they, along with the rest of the Nempeo clan, they were all there, big pictures. And then all of a sudden coming through these doors were two older ladies. And they were talking Tewa to each other. And they had their shawls around. They were kind of waddling out together. And they sat down on a bench. And they continued to talk. And right as soon as they sat down, I saw some people that had, were coming through the exhibit. And they were, they were English-speaking people. And so they were talking to these two older women, telling them what a beautiful exhibit it was, how happy they were, and what beautiful work they do, how honored they were to be there and to see them. And the two ladies were shaking their heads like this and smiling, thank you, thank you, they were saying. And so after the people left, I continued to watch because I knew what was going on. And these two older women, they sat there very quietly. Finally, one of them broke the silence and leaned over to the other and said, in Tewa, do you know what those people were talking to us about? <laughs> and the other said, no, I thought maybe you knew. And they started laughing. They said, no, I didn't understand a word they were saying. And so sitting next to my Saya, Nelly, right here, was Maria Martinez. And they were two of the best friends. Whenever they would have exhibits that, that brought them together or, or places, programs, they enjoyed one another's company. And so from there, um, I started to learn more about my grandmother. And then when I was here in Texas, working at the museum, um, at the Panhandle Plains Museum here in Canyon, Texas, I worked with them. And one of the, in the education department said, Drina, I don't know if you know this, but there's a new book out about your great grandmother. And I said, what? And she goes, I'm going to order it and I'll give it to you when we get it in so you can take a look at it. And so, um, I looked at it and flipped through the pages and I said, oh, this author did a great job. And so this was the book that she was talking about. Now, before I had seen, she kind of told me about it and um, she gave me the name and who the author was and and told me a little bit more about it. And I said, OK, I'm going to Albuquerque and I'll see if the Pueblo Cultural Center has it in their bookshelf. And so when I went there, I went specifically to see if they had it on their bookshelf. And they did. And I walked in there and I said, oh, there it is. There's the name. Uh, Kramer was on it and Nampeo right here on the on the edge. And so I went and it was kind of on a top shelf and I grabbed it and I pulled it down. Now I had seen pictures of my Saya Nempeo, but she was usually looking down, working on her pots or looking to the side or something like this. 
I never saw her face to face. And so when I pulled it down and I turned it and I saw her, that was the first time I ever looked into her eyes. And I looked at her and I said, Saya, I said, I'm in Tewa, I was telling her that I was her granddaughter and that um, her daughter Nelly was my Saya and my father, who his name was. And I said, I finally get to see you face to face. And so I held her close and I thought, you know, you have been a good influencer in my life and you didn't even know it back then. And so that's a little bit about Nempeo. One of the other things that I wanted to touch on was as my life was starting to continue to move on and move forward, there were many things that came up into my world. And when I um, came here to Amarillo, my daughters were basketball players for the city of Canyon. And they were called the Canyon Lady Eagles. And the program has, has, has over 10 state championships. I don't even know what the number is now. But when my oldest daughter, Catherine, was playing, um, she was with great, great players. And they had had great players even before her time. But they were going to state. And Catherine uh, was able to um, have back-to-back-to-back uh, to back to back state champions. And in one of the years, they were considered one of the national basketball girls um, teams. And so she was a part of that her fresh or her sophomore year. And then um, her little sister came behind her, Sherilyn, and she too won state champions. So we made that, that route from, from Canyon, Texas to Austin before they moved it down to San Antonio. But one day I went to the Panhandle um, Plains Museum's archives and the lady there knew me well. And she said, Drina, she says, um, when I knew you were going to come in, I set out some magazines and some books on the table that you like to look at things at. And um, so take some time and go through it. You might like some of the things I have there. And I said, oh, thank you. Thank you. And so in one of them, there was a magazine from Montana. And I started flipping through it and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what? And then I started to discover that this is just a copy. I know I um, can't see it. it. It's been marked on and everything because I've had it in my possession, but it was about the Fort Shaw um, ladies that won the world championship during the Louisiana Purchase um, exhibition that they had. And it, it was in St. Louis, Missouri, back in 1902, I believe it was, 1904. And so um, I was reading up about them. And I thought, where were these stories when I was growing up? Never heard about these girls. And it was back in the early 1900s. The thing I really enjoyed most about that uh, story, because my aunties and I at one time were cheerleaders. And whenever I would see my, my aunt in um, Maryland, she would always show me the cheers that, that they would do at the Albuquerque Indian School boarding school. She was a cheerleader there and she would, she would get all riled up and she would um, get down on her knee and she would just put her fist in the air and tell me all kinds of stories about her becoming a cheerleader and what they did. And so when I saw this cheer in the, in the story, because the girls, the basketball was brought to the boarding school. And at first it was for the boys, but the boys kind of thought, oh, they, they didn't, it didn't hold their interest. And so the, the coach teacher there, the, they said, well, let me introduce it to the girls and see what they think about it. Because a lot of times, they do things together. And so he did. And the girls caught on and they were good at it. And so from that point on, these girls were competing with area schools, uh, high schools, colleges, you know, boys, girls. And then their ability was so well known that they were invited to go to this Louisiana Purchase exhibit. And and kind of live at what they created like a model school. 
And so they were making their journey from Fort Shaw Indian School all the way across country to Missouri. And along the way, they had competitions. And that was a way that they earned um, funding to get from one place to another. And also, one of the things that they did is that even though they were basketball players, they also were very well um, in music, singing, poetry, reading, um, all kinds of things. So they would take their traditional clothes with them so that after the games, they would put on a performance for the audience and the audience would pay to see them and watch them and sometimes pay to watch the games too. And so that was how they got the funding done. Now, mind you, a lot of you and Gail, I know that you have um, played basketball before, but can you imagine playing basketball in wool dresses that were down below your knees with these little pantaloons that came underneath it? And I mean, the, the stiff shoes that they wore and these girls were up and down the court, but they were great at, at what they did. They were good shooters, fast, quick. And um, so one of the things that happened, though, was that the audience, a lot of the people started to say, you know, these girls are overexerting themselves. They shouldn't be sweating this much. And so they were wanting to kind of um, allow, uh, disband girls playing basketball. But somebody came up with the idea of, okay, well, then why don't we just create a half court basketball? And so it was kind of divided in three parts. Um, and so the girls could not go beyond uh, a certain place if they were in a, in a playing a certain position. And so that's how a lot of schools, um, even here in the panhandle, I hear women talking about that, that they only played like half court basketball. And I thought, oh, that, that was probably really hard. <clears throat> especially if you were able to do the full court at one time. But these girls did it. They went on um, to go and compete, and they were up against one of the toughest teams when they got there. One by one, teams were coming in to play them. I don't know, maybe three times a week or something, and they were just beating them, beating them, beating them. Finally, this team came in to compete against them. And that's why they ended up getting the title of the world's champion because this team was so good and they beat them. And when they were getting ready to, to leave, the kids were so excited for their journey. They all gathered together in the, in the open area. It's kind of like they called it the parade grounds. And they send them on with a cheer. And now today, these cheers probably don't make sense to us. But back then, I could just imagine them as they were chanting, bummeling, bummeling, bow, wow, wow, chingaling, chingaling, chow, 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 bummeling, chingaling, who are we? Fort Shaw, Fort Shaw, rah, rah, rah. And the girls were sent off on the journey across the country. And they were great examples of who. The native spirit is athletes, artists, writers, storytellers, environmentalists, chemists, doctors, medicine, men and women. We got it all. And if only people would take time to listen to the story, they'll discover what the women of this country really have within them. And so as our time is drawing near, I'm going to very quickly just kind of hold up some books for you to kind of take a look at. These women influenced my life. But one first book that I want to share with you is one, when I first started my storytelling journey, a man by the name of Finley Stewart was the president at the time, and he encouraged me to come and find out what it was like to be a professional storyteller because that was what I asked him. What's the difference between a, a storyteller and a professional storyteller? And he said, well, you're an educator, right? And I said, yes. And he said, well, anybody could be an educator, but would they let them teach in the classroom? What do you have to have in order to teach in the classroom? And that's when I got it. 
But when I went to my very first festival, I came across this book because inside of it were some of the masters. And I want to show you, this book is, has been signed by many of them. But this woman right here was one of my great inspirations. Gail Ross. And from there, I came across a book that she had. And I thought to myself, oh, what would it be like to be an author? How do you even let your, your stories go? Will they take care of them? Will they hold them and cherish them as much as you do? And so one day I was called upon <clears throat> and I have a story in this book, Trickster. But at first I wasn't sure that I wanted to do that because I thought, I don't know if they're gonna handle these stories well. And so I called one of the authors that said, yes, her name was Sunny Dooley. And I knew if Sunny said yes, I wanted to find out why she said yes, because she was very conservative with how her stories are put out there and told or even put in a book. And she told me why she said yes and how she got permission. And I thought, okay, well, if she feels confident in this person, I will too. And that's when I went ahead and submitted this story that I love to tell about Horn Toad Lady and Coyote. And that's the story that's in it. Well, in the meantime, I also, one of the things that I came across was a story about Elizabeth White. Her name was uh, Pulling Yasi. And this story, it's, 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 um, I, it's well used because I look through it all the time. It's called No Turning Back. And when I first read this story, it reminded me of when I was growing up back at First Mesa. But one thing that stood out in this book to me that, that touched my heart is that she said when she was a young girl back at Second Mesa, or, or not Second Mesa, in, in um, well, yeah, it was Second Mesa. Um, one of the things that they would do is they would, uh, early in the morning, they would walk to the edge of the village. And they would say their morning prayers. Many families would all be coming out out of their houses, walking to the edge of the mesa, and they would say their morning prayers. And before they would turn around, they would spit. And when I read that, I thought, spit? Why would they spit? And she said, they spit because they wanted to get rid of yesterday and things that happened. And when they turned around, they were going to start their new day. And visually, I thought, oh, my goodness, what wisdom. And the, she also said that every time we would go by, there was a house and there was an old man that always sat up there. And all day long, she said, I would always see him up there. So one day I asked my mom, how come that old man is always up there? She kind of got reprimanded reprimanded and she said don't don't be saying that she said that is our chief you think about him because every time you see him up there he's praying for us we are his children all of us and he's praying for the good to come to us for goodness to come to the land and for the people not just us but beyond beyond the people we've never know who is there. He's praying for everybody and everything. And so when I heard that, it brought tears to my eyes. I couldn't imagine life back then, how simple it was. So these are just a few things. Uh, Esther Martinez, Blue Water, LaDonna Harris, a wonderful woman, Paula, um, Dunn Allen, uh, never got to meet her, but she's Laguna. And her, her family came to Laguna Lands way back when and started up the first um, uh, trading post. And then uh, a, Ch a Chickasaw woman by the name of Pearl Carter Scott. I haven't read her book yet, but I'm getting, I want to. And then in my life, Stella Long, a wonderful Choctaw storyteller 
She put some books together. And then one of the people that I want to mention, she's not Native, but she did wonderful things for the Native people throughout the world. And that is Angie Debo. She wrote a book, And Still the Waters Run. This is a powerful book. If you ever have a chance to read it, especially if you live in Oklahoma, um, she got in trouble for that. I mean, she had to be careful as she was researching the information for that. She said, you know, she was sometimes she had a little bit of fear in her as she was putting this together. But I want to thank everybody. I know the time went by fast. That's what storytelling does in our world. It just goes by so fast. But we always want to take time for the people because we're not promised tomorrow as as people. And of course, our loved ones, we don't know if they're going to be there when we go home to see them again. So always cherish those times. Take time to just be with one another and to learn the history of the people that you come from. Mm -hmm. So I uh, thank you and have a great week. Drina. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about a woman that all of Native America was so inspired? Um, the very first Native head of the Department of the Interior. We were used to having Indian people heading up the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but this woman is over the whole department. And I know she's someone you know about. And yes. Yes, I remembered her when she when I was in high school at Laguna Acoma High School. Her family came through, and because they were military, they were they were moving constantly. But there was a, a portion in time when uh, the girls uh, all came and were part of the Laguna a Acoma High School. And so I knew Deb Holland, and I went. I was classmates with her sister Denise, and and so they were wonderful women. My mother loved to um, talk about their mother. Uh, they, she said that she was just a kind woman, very well educated, and she was so proud of her accomplishments. And um, so when Deb was going through all that she, you know, that uh, the just going one day at a time, one day at a time, you know, I would hear about her uh, through her sister, Denise, because Denise had an arts and craft place and a, a little bakery shop, a little cafe sandwich soup place. And whenever I would go there, um, I would visit with her and she would tell me about her family members and she would talk to me about um, her sister, um, Deb. She was making some, I think it was salsa that she was putting in jars and selling them and stuff. And uh, she would, you know, her sisters would always help her and everything. But, and then she talked about her um, uh, being the uh, democratic um, chair I think for maybe New Mexico or something. And so I said, Oh, well, you know, and then I saw her on TV, you know, they had spotlighted her and I said, Oh, there's Deb, you know? And, and so um, through that time, you know, she was running for different offices and um, learning a little bit more about the government and all of this. And, and um, a lot of times because, um, you know, we would just hear about her things. And then she was a part of the Laguna um, Development Corporation that is a, a business entity of the tribe. And so I would hear her name here and there and not get to see her very often because she lived in the Albuquerque area, but very supportive from a distance of what she was accomplishing in the world. And when she was up there um, getting sworn in, I, I just could just imagine the um, excitement that was coming from her mother and her sisters and brother and her and her family members and her daughter and you know just to be there to witness to feel the air to hear the laughter I know there was a a large party from New Mexico that went out there with her and so um, I was very proud to see all of them enjoy themselves and to be a part of that history. Thank you for bringing that up, Gail. Aldrina, uh, we have the handsome C of Osh that has been looking at some of the comments for you. So we're not letting you go quite yet. Okay. <laughs> Aldrina, I really enjoyed your presentation and your storytelling. It's amazing how the culture of your Pueblo relatives carries such a beautiful history and that you can be that medium through your storytelling, the art. 
really enjoyed your say a story um and MPO, and i love pottery and i love the pottery you showed us today i've been curious about it but could, could you tell us more about how the traditional pots are made um well you know throughout um wherever the potters are located um throughout the country because um in my journeys i have met other potters potters from the chickasha people the you know there's uh navajo potters there's but what i grew up was Pueblo pottery, especially back home on uh, at First Mesa. And so um, the families that I come from, they, <clears throat> they would find um, kind of like clay mines, basically, but they knew how much to take and how much to leave. My Saya always said, you know, just get enough for what you need. And a lot of times she would take me with her but she would have me, um, you know, sit at a certain spot sometimes. And she said, I'm going to go way back here and I'm going to dig for my clay and then I'll bring it back. And, and then every now and then, I think one time I went with her, I don't remember where the spot was, but it was a ways from the village. And we, and we walked a while and she would take these huge cloths that she would put the clay in because they were like um, almost like rock. And then she would tie it up and carry one on her back and maybe um, one on her hand. And I'd take a little one. She'd always make me a little one because I wasn't as strong as she was. And then we'd walk all the way back. And so they were they got their clay from different places. And a lot of the times the potters would share that information with each other. Every now and then they'd come across clay that was red. But most of the clay that my Saya used was gray. And then when it was fired, it turned into a brown color and the red clay just stayed red. Um, so those were all over. And, and whenever they found them, um, a lot of the potters uh, would share that information. And, and But one of the things that my aunt would say, uh, Dextra Kotskova, she would tell her, uh, her fellow potters, you know, just remember not to take too much. Because a lot of times, if you took too much too, it could cause it to fall down and, and you could get hurt, but it, it would uh, mess up the landscape. So, you know, don't be careful when you, you dig into it. So, yeah, no, no place in particular, but they knew, they knew where to find them. That's so cool. Uh, so Jacob on YouTube asked, the desert so unknown to me, his uh, family is a Cherokee nation, said growing up in such barren, harsh conditions in the desert, uh, were there any difficult or hard times that come to mind? You know, um, I think about that often. My favorite place was to go on top of First Mesa. After we would get our chores done, my dad and I and my Saya. Of course, my Saya couldn't make the journey like she once did when she was younger because she she grew up there up on top. And then she came down below when um, when they were starting to build houses. And then Bale was one of the first ones to to build a house down below. Uh, and they were encouraged to do that by the government because they said, if you don't start making uh, houses down here, the government's going to think that you're not going to use it. And so they'll start taking land from you thinking that you're not going to use it. And so the people were always on top of the mesas for safety reasons, really. And then eventually when the first ones started coming down, then eventually more families came down. But they had trails going up and down. And my dad and I would take those trails because he wanted to go and visit his relatives up on top. And he would invite me to go. And as we would go up the trails, <clears throat> we would look back and as the higher up we got, it was just beautiful. The sand was so soft that your feet just kind of dug into it. And then I would go um, sometimes on my own and just sit at the edge of the mesa where no houses were. It was just the rock, the solid rock up high. And it would look out over a sea of desert and so quiet. You could hear people talking that lived down below on the far end of uh, Palaka, the town. And so that was my joy, was to sit at the edge and just look out over the vast desert. But it was not void. It was full of life and full of sound. And that was my place of retreat. And every now and then when I need a place to go, I will go to those places in my mind. 
I will close my eyes and picture myself back at those places that I loved. And they were usually on rocks and at the edge. (laughs) Even though I'm afraid of heights, I even made that journey. That was worth it to me. That's awesome. Well, that's all the questions for now. Thank you so much, Aldrina, for sharing. Thank you. So I, everybody, thank you for inviting me. Aldrina, my honor. The first, I have not been able to put my arms around you in four years. <laughs> I'm so, you, you know, my eyes saw you. Today, my heart is so big. I have smiled so much. I usually close this thing out, but you have made me just, my heart's so big. I'm just tearful looking for the time you're in the museum. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank we you. will all be together again. Yes. Oh, and we I'm- are. You've been on our nine foot jumbotron. People have been enjoying you here in the museum. Uh, we want to remind people that, you know, thanks to the lovely, my good friend, Gail Ross, uh, these stories are archived on our website. It is always our intent to send these out around the globe, you know, to have these stories told, but also that people will build on this traditional knowledge and and talk about the, you know, during Women's History Month, we have some more programming coming up. Please go to our website. Um, and also, again, history starts at home. I don't know if we could have had a better session drawing strength from the past for the, for the forward journey. Um, again, thank you so very much. One last shameless bit of advertising. There's three days left to vote for the Museum of Native American History for top 10 history museums in the United States. You, it's a USA Today, go to top 10 best. You could have talked all day, Missy. Um, you know, again, next time you're here in the neighborhood, please stop in and all of you listening, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Have a great day. <laughs> thank you.